All right, I consider the extraneous muscles in main function. That's how I view them. Um, in the shoulder, we find muscles that hold the scapula to the trunk, some that hold the humerus to the shoulder joint, and then we have a bunch of muscles to move the arm around. First, let's look at the anchor as the shoulder joint to the trunk, the shoulder to the trunk muscles. Most of those muscles attach to the medial vertebral border of the scapula and reach upward in the back or wrap around the rib cage, pulling the shoulder towards the rib cage. In the back, we got the muscle, one name to levator the scapula. I want you to visualize a muscle that reaches from the medial upper border of the scapula up the side of the neck into the vertebra of C1 to C4. What do you think is this muscle's action? Elevate the scapula. Elevate the scapula. Can you see my screen now? What do you see now? Do you see a PowerPoint or do you see the... I see the test question. Oh, up there, not the answer. That's weird, man. That changed this on me. Hold on. I got to shift around every single time here. All right. You see... Get out of here. You see a PowerPoint now? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So these are the muscles that we're talking about. The shoulder blade is here. And the muscles anchoring the shoulder blade to the rib cage. So a lot of them go from the medial side of the shoulder blade up to the rib, to the vertebra or to the neck. And then we do have one, the big one that comes from the inside of the shoulder blade and wraps around the chest right in here. You see how it anchors into the rib cage. And then we got one more that comes from the front here, from the coracoid. Remember the coracoid process? Mm -hmm. no. down into the rib cage. But the first was this muscle, the levator scapula. And what, is, what did you say is the action again? It elevates the scapula, something like that. It elevates the scapula and rotates the, uh, the, the cavity down. Okay, so if you see that, if you look at this one, it's a little hard to do, but if you reach your shoulder up to your neck, you know, like your boss is mad at me kind of stuff. Like you go up like that. If you can see me, then this muscle from right here contracts and goes up into the neck. And so it elevates that shoulder blade. The other thing, though, that it does is when you think about there is a shoulder blade rotates around an axis and the axis is right here in the middle. It's gonna, if this pulls up, it's gonna bring this down a little bit. So it's gonna pull this glenoid cavity, which is right here where the humerus goes into the shoulder joint. So there's a shoulder blade in itself. That goes downward. And that, what that means rotate the cavity down. Mm. Is that sensible to you guys? Cavity. Yes. Good. Questions, you reach out to me. Oh, what did I do? Hold on. Gosh, purple. There we go. I hope. Good. And I made a mistake here. Are these multiple choice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want that. That just shows you all the answers. We don't need that. We need you all to, qu to guess. Mm -hmm. Are you guys taking any other classes? Yeah. Two more. Two more. All right, so whatever you learn from the other classes that go online that you like, you got to tell me. <laughs> Deal? I gave you extra credit. Okay. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> there is my money. Is your credit, huh? <laughs> Each suggestion gives you 10 points. How about that? All right, uh, the next one is the order muscle on the back is attached to the scapula. The spine reaches from the vertebral border. To the spinous process, what is this muscle called? Rhomboids. There you go. That's the rhomboids. Rhomboids. That's the <laughs> rhomboids. Why can I not do that right there? Oh, this screen checking is fat. It goes slow. There we go. So the rhomboids, actually, it shows here nice, really, where you see this is the levator scapula going up. You see my screen here? PowerPoint. You see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. If you don't, you tell me because for some reason I have to indicate every time we screen up on you to see. 
Um, so that's the levator scapula. And the other one, just you reach further down on the shoulder blade here on the edge, and it goes into the spine. And those are the rhomboids. So that was that next discussion point here. And then we go into the next one. Number three, if you put the palm of your hand on the top of your shoulder, you can squeeze the next muscle. It usually feels good when it's worked because it gets tired holding up the shoulder blade over time. That makes sense. It is a broad muscle that is most superficially covering most of the upper back as well as the back of the neck. What is that muscle called? Trapezius. 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 Perfect. Trapezius. And, uh, you see this? You see the PowerPoint? No. No. Only the question. Oh God. Okay. Here it is. There you go. That's the trapezius. We talked about it already with the axial skeletons. But it's this broad, most superficial muscle that does a lot of things. And if you see a muscle that that that's big and it's on the outside, you can imagine it does a lot of big motions. If a muscle is deeper like this deeper here, that basically pulls the shoulder blade backwards towards the shoulder, towards the spine. This muscle does many more motions. So the more the superficial that a muscle is, the more global, the more bigger motions it does, the deeper a muscle is, the more it has to do with stabilizing things. I know, that's a little goofy maybe, but that's the trapezius. If you have no question to that, we'll move to the next one. If you have questions, you speak up, okay? Okay. And then I'm going to try to have a breakout session after we go through the questions uh, where you guys at, you know, talk to each other a little bit and make sure some questions that arise that we can ask them to me or the whole class. And then we'll see if that format helps a little bit or not. Um, if you watch boxing, especially now it's so boring, huh? We can watch anything we can. You know of this muscle because it holds the shoulder blade to the chest. Punching things will make that muscle very strong. You can see finger-like bulges following the ribs on the side of the chest when it contracts, almost looking kind of like a serrated knife's edges. You know a serrated knife, right? It's the bread knife that has wiggles on it. Mm -hmm. That's that. And what is this muscle that we're talking about? The serratus anterior. Correct. The serratus anterior. So that would be right here. So if you look at here, these edges... That looks like a serrated knife. That's why they named it like that. So anatomists are just boring drunks. That's basically it, right? They got to visualize and think, hmm, what am I going to say with this? So anterior means to the front and serratus means it's the, the knife wise. So that's that. Very important muscles. That very many people have a weakness on that. So if you do push-ups or just hold the shoulder blade to the chest when your weight needs to, well, the, your weight wants to fall down here, right? Instead of it falling down, the serratus contracts, so it pulls the chest up into the shoulder blade, so it holds it up. So that's a very good way to strengthen that muscle. And if you look at, you know, if you look at our, uh, our stance, very often we're both forward. We're not, you know, if you can see that, we're not standing up straight. And a lot of that has to do because the shoulder blade wings forward because it's not contracting strongly against the chest. And that, you know, that part of that is because we're standing upright and we're not on four legs like we used to be as animals. But part of that is also because our serratus anterior is not that strong. It's one of the wimpier ones. All right. Jinkwe. Lastly, in this bunch, we have one muscle that starts in the front of the coracoid process and reaches down and inward and attaches on the ribs. So underneath a big arm muscle that we'll discuss soon. The big, big muscle is above that. Can you think of that deeper muscle on the inside? The pectoralis minor. The pectoralis minor, right here, that one. Good, 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 good. Pec minor. Pec minor is right here. Coracoid in the front of the chest, down into, the, you can just see how that just, it, it kind of holds the shoulder blade tight in there, you know, it doesn't move it that much, it just holds it, it holds it uh, 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 so it's stable. Can you visualize that? 
Yeah. Any background noise, people? Mute it. If you don't talk, mute, please. Thank you. I know it's a problem. That's one of the new things we got to learn, that mute, unmute thing. All right. Next is right here. Says, the next group of muscles are concerned with holding the humerus, which is the upper arm bone, into the shoulder joint, the glenoid cavity. The shoulder is very flexible yet strong. The rotator cuffs are four muscles, three of them spanning from the back of the shoulder blade, the scapula, to the greater tubercle, which is the bump on the outside of the upper arm bone. You know that one, right, by now? Yeah. Good, because that's on the test. Oh, I should have told you that. Um, and then uh, we have one of the muscles that reach from underneath the shoulder blade to the lesser tubercle, which is more in the front of the shoulder, like more right next to the coracoid process. Can you name those four muscles? There you go. Somebody doing it. <laughs> okay, I hear Terry's minor, supra, in front, subscap, right? That's the right ones? Yes. All right. Let's look at them real quick. Those are cool. Have you ever heard of frozen shoulder syndrome? Yeah. Mm -mm. No. No. So some people, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're young when you get older, they can't move their <laughs> shoulder around. It's stuck. And, and a lot of times, one of those muscles gets messed up. And, and the, the, the reason is these muscles are really, really working hard because their mo main job is to grab that arm and yank it into the shoulder blade. And, you know, the shoulder is very flexible. You, can, you can't do this with a hip. I mean, you can, but if you're Simone Biles, but not if you're me. And, and so and in, in the shoulder, you've got these muscles that specifically hold the arm in, but they always have to work. It's a continuous job. They do some motions. When you bend your elbow, she, I can't see if you can see me. When you bend your elbow and you move this way to the outside, you rotate it, then these muscles back here do that work. If you go the other way, you go inward, the one on the inside of the shoulder blade does that work. But that's it. Most of the time, what they do is they just yank the, the arm into the shoulder blade. And so the supra is on top. That's why I made you study supraspinous fossa and infraspinous fossa. Because they are the muscles, infraspinatus and supraspinatus, right? Uh, and then teres main minor, you just got to study that. It's just a different name. That's just one of those. We got to have a teres major cone, but the teres minor is a small helper. Goes from the side of the shoulder blade right to the below, the bottom part of the greater tubercle. And then the underside is this large scapularis muscle. What's interesting is, you know, the scapularis starts right here. And right on the edge on it, on the shoulder blade, is the one that then goes to the front, which was the serratus anterior, this muscle down in here. And then above that medial border is the one, on, in the back is the rhomboids that also attach there from here and go to the shoulder blade, I mean the, the spine, sorry. But these muscles get injured heavily, especially the supraspinatus, because it said that the lateral portion of the supraspinatus has not much blood supply, so it's bound to tear right around here right around here it tears so they call mm -hmm. that tearing they call it calcifications like calcium deposits in the muscle uh, when you read an MRI report anyway that's the supraspinatus that way you have a little background data about these rotator cuff muscles very interesting muscle group you only have one question on it but now we're going to get up to raise your arm in front of the show in front, which is shoulder flexion. What muscles bulge when you do that? The one on the top of the shoulder is definitely involved. What is that muscle called? Deltoid. Deltoid. So when I study muscles, one of the things that um, is, is, is what I try to do is I try to resist the range of motion. So if I raise my shoulder up, and I resist it, the muscle here starts bulging up. Like it's an isometric con uh, contraction, not isotonic. Isotonic is moving. Isometric is you're holding something, and the muscle stays in the same. So I hold a cup while with something in it, and this muscle starts bulging up because that's what does that action. And so that's how you can learn about muscles. Go and – oops – 
Where's my deltoid? Give me my deltoid. Oh, not that one. There it is. And so you do that action right here. It says arm, well, arm abduction. The abduction is the main one, but the forward is also involving it. And you can feel it because that muscle goes around. Oh, wait, am I sharing my screen with you guys? Yes, I am. Good. Uh, you, the muscle goes from the back of the shoulder blade to the side of the shoulder blade to the front of the shoulder blade. And every motion, bringing it back, bringing the arm forward, bringing it to the side, will contract that muscle. And so that's how you can feel a muscle. What it does is by looking at the action, the motion, and then uh, reproducing it and resisting it or taking away. You can also learn how to take two weights. I mean, you've got to be careful, but if you want to want to strengthen this muscle, you look at what action does that muscle do, and that's what you do with weights. And then you've got to build that muscle up. You got that? Yep. My little blah, blah, blah things. All right, mm -hmm. let's move right, right along. As long as I have concentration, it's going to fade fast. I can tell you that. Another muscle that helps move the arm is attached to the front of the chest. Right where the ribs attached to the chest plate. Mus that muscle's main pull of the humerus towards the midline is adduction, right? Adding back to the midline. What is that muscle called? Pectoralis major. Pec major. Yes, man. There we go. That's the big. Where are we? Pec major. Give me a pec. I think I got that one wrong when I did it. And I think that's the one I had a question about. But I'm not sure. Who that? Shamim. Hi! Hey, I'm in the car. I know, I know. Did you get it wrong? You thought you got it right and the system took it wrong? Or you think you just got it I wrong? I don't know. I don't even have my book on me right now. Okay. Oh. Well, if, if you want to catch when you got your book, you just text me. We'll talk about it offline. Okay. All okay? right. Okay. So, can, you explain, can you talk about it some more? Yeah, yeah. Let me see where I'm at with it. Absolutely. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Good. So, um, yeah, that muscle is attached all the way on the clavicle and then all the way uh, to the chest plate, to the lower part of the ribs here. And it anchors into the, um, in, it's called the intertubercular groove, which is between the little tubercles, kind of in between. And, and when you see where it is, you know, it brings the arm towards the midline. And so it, 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 it what was the question about? I forgot the question. Now. It brings the arm, yeah, as in adduction. So it brings the arm inward. So if the muscle is attached if you can see, let me know if you can't see me because I can't see myself. The muscle yeah, you It goes into the arm here. So when it contracts, the motion does, it brings the arm in. So it's like this motion. And it does a little bit of palm down motion or internal rotation of the whole arm kind of motion because just where it's attached. But the main thing that you want to remember is bringing it in, sort of in and forward. Because then we got one that brings the arm in and towards the back a little bit more. What is that one called? You guys know? I know. I put you on the spot now, huh? <laughs> Let's see that the next one. There we go. That one. Next muscle is found on the side of towards the back. It pulls the arm back. In extension, it's very involved in swimmers. What is that one called? The uh, latissimus dorsi. The latissimus dorsi. So that's sort of the, almost in some ways, an equivalent to the pec in the front. The pec major, the latissimus dorsi, is this gigantic muscle that spans a whole back. You can see that? So on, 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 on and you look at, look at Michael Phelps, that's his latissimus dorsi. Those guys want some swimming medals too, but look at how small they are. Like, it's incredible. And so, that muscle is all the way back here that goes from the hip up into the inner arm and brings the muscle, the arm down as in doing a crawling motion or a freestyle motion. So that's the up, so that's sort of the, the balancer in the back to the pec major is the latissimus dorsi. Good? Yes. Got it. So if, yeah, it's, got it. 
You had a question? No, good. All right. And then the Latissimus Dorsey has a little cousin, and it's called the teres major. So when we looked at the teres minor, that's like attached here and goes to the tubercle up here. So it becomes more, more of a muscle that brings the arm in. But the teres major is kind of more like a helper further down at the bottom of the shoulder, but it goes right to where the Latissimus Dorsey goes to the intertubercular groove. Um, and so it, it's kind of, it moves the arm like the latissimus dorsi. So it's more, you want to associate the teres major with latissimus dorsi and the teres minor with rotator cuff. Hey, Professor, um, which muscle did you say isn't on the term list because some people were born without it? The palmaris longus? Okay, sorry. I thought it was the, this one for some reason. No, people better have that one. <laughs> uh, but but the ter but the but Palmari's long was he's on the term list, no? Oh, that's right. Okay, good because I better be on the term list. Otherwise, you're gonna put it on there. I already made my videos. If you get this tip, if you get the hint. Um, yeah, I know I'm giving it away again. You just start to pay attention. So that's Terry's. Um, I mean, that's Latissimus Dorsey, and then the Terry's major is part of that. Now let's go down to the elbow. And we, if you look at the elbow, what motion we got? We mainly got, we mainly got um, um, bending the elbow, which is flexion, and straightening it back out, right? So that's the main joint here between the humerus and then the ulna. And then on the side, we have another part. We have the radius that goes down, but that's more motion in the forearm where we can do the supination and pronation. That's more forearm motion. That's not elbow itself motion. So mostly what we worry about in the elbow is flexion extension, forward and backwards motion. And so let's see what the question is here. There are many muscles that help with bending the motion. Can you name the main two ones? Anybody? Pronator, teres. Nope. No. Okay. Nope. That, we get to that in a minute. That one is the one that brings the palm down. So that's, maybe that's, four maybe that's the one I got wrong. Biceps. Brachialis is one, absolutely, brachialis. And biceps brachii. And biceps brachii, yes. Wait, and then, I got it wrong. I got the brachialis and the bicep brachii, but I got it wrong. Huh. We got to look at that. I thought we looked at that already. Hold it on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Did, did anybody else get it like that? Yeah, but it was like two weeks ago. Yeah, that's true, huh? Oh, when did you do it? Yeah, maybe, maybe I changed it, Johanna. Two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Let me double check because maybe I, maybe I fixed it. All right. <laughs> but I want to make sure in case that you guys can be okay that knowing you're going right. But those are the two right answers. Now you see how the program works, huh? Bam. Nope, we got them right here. But it could have been that you took it before I fixed it. I might have fixed it. I did, like two weeks ago. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, <laughs> that's it for that. So let's go back to the preview session here. Give it to me. Okay, so we're clear. And then the coracobrachialis is another one that comes up, right? What would that be? The coracobrachialis muscle is... Let's go right here. That one is a small muscle that we don't really talk about in a question, but it's, you know, look at the name. It's coracol, coracoid process right here. And brachialis is the upper arm. So that's where all the name. If you see the name brachii, you better think upper arm neighborhood, right? And so instead of that muscle, if you look at where it's at that, it does not cross the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint, I mean, the elbow joint, that would be down here. It only crosses the shoulder joint. So that's another way to think about these things. Where does the muscle go? You know, what joint does it cover? I mean, what joint does it cross? And most likely, well, always, it will influence that joint. It will move that joint. So that's when you look at the coracobrachialis and you really analyze it through, you can see how that's not one that moves the elbow. Moves the shoulder. All right. That makes sense? Yep. Oh, good. Yeah. 
I know. You always have to all mute and mute back. But I need that feedback. I'm a little insecure, you know. And then there's one main muscle that extends the elbow. What's that one? Tricep brachia. Triceps. If you, that's the big one. Right? Yeah. Triceps brachia. Yeah, right here in the back. You see that? This big honking thing in the back. Are you showing us the answer? Yeah, so oh. that's the biceps brachia right in here. So the front has multiple muscles. The back just has one big muscle. But it's interesting because if you think about it in the front, in the front, you got the biceps brachia, which is bi means two, right? So the biceps brachia has one head that goes to the coracobrachialis and then to the elbow, crosses the elbow. And the other one goes all the way to the shoulder blade and then it crosses the elbow. And then underneath that, we got the brachialis, which is another one that goes from the arm down to the elbow. And that makes three. The two biceps and the brachialis is three. In the back, we just have one big one. And it's made out of three heads. Tri means three. So we have one that goes like the biceps into the shoulder blade itself. And then we're going to have two that are attached uh, in the arm and go into the electron process, actually, in, into the tip of the elbow. You know that's the electron process, right? you got to know the electron process. It's on the test. I just fixed that question. Mm -hmm. yeah. process. I'm giving it away again. All right, but that makes sense, the upper arm stuff like that? Yes. Good. Yes. But let's see, what else we got? The wrist motions are produced in the forearm. Many of the anterior forearm muscles attached to the distal, numerous on the inside. The medial epicondyle, that is, and then reach towards the wrist. One of them actually crosses the upper forearm and pulls the radius across the ulna so that the palm goes down, which is pronation. What's that also called? Pronator teres. That's the pronator teres. Good one. So when I look at... Wait, I got to cheat for a second. Hold on. I got to make sure I have a question on that. We have not talked about the brachial radialis. Let's do that first real quick before we get to pronator teres. So there is one muscle that's kind of a little bit of a troublemaker for us. It's called the tennis elbow muscle. Have you heard of tennis elbow? Nobody? No. Really? You guys are way too young. Yeah. We're too young. <laughs> well, you don't play tennis, huh? But that also no, helps. Play like softball and got it. There you go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because what happens is when you have to do this motion with the wrist, you see my, my picture here? You have to do a lot of this motion with the wrist, bring it up. That muscle right here gets activated. So that's the brachioradialis. So let's look at the word. Brachio means upper arm. That's where it starts. And then radialis means radius. So it goes into the moss into the bone that goes towards the thumb, the radius. And so when you look at that, it goes, can you see me? It goes mm -hmm. right here all the way down towards the thumb. And it does this motion kind of. But it does all with the elbow flexion. But so that's why when we hold like a tennis racket and you have to do a lot of this motion, that's when that gets irritated too much. You can do that in gardening. It doesn't have, or some other activity. It doesn't have to be tennis. It's just called that way. Mm -hmm. Can you visualize that? Oh, yeah. Good. And so that's the brachioradialis. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting one. It, it sounds like it's an upper arm muscle, which it is, but it really reaches in the forearm. And so I use it in the, in the, in the school when we talk about, uh, when we have the model in front of us, When I talk then about the forearm muscles, this is the front of your forearm, right? Right here. You see that? The brachioradialis is right here, going from the uh, distal part of the upper, the humerus, the, the, the part that's most to the elbow, and then it goes to the styloid process, which is right at the tip of the radius. And so that's the muscle. And on us, 
that muscle is sort of laying on top here. Like when you have a model or an arm like that, and well, and you go from the outside elbow and you go down towards the thumb, that's that muscle bulge. You can sort of see it bulging out here. All right, and then anything further, everything in the front part then becomes the muscles that we talk about now, the flexors muscles. And then everything on the opposite side, in the back by the elbow side, that becomes muscles that do the extension motion of the wrist or the hand. The other thing with this is all the finger, mo a lot of the finger motion muscles are in the forearm. So now the muscle that I asked of you guys is that pronator teres right here. So you see that's the inside of the elbow and it reaches right across to the radius and when it contracts it's going to bring that radius across the ulna right here over it. And if you see that here what that does if you look the thumb going towards the inside that will bring the palm down and that's pronation. And that's why that muscle is known as the pronator teres. And one thing that's crucially important clinically about that is the nerve here, the median nerve goes through that muscle. Anybody at carpal tunnel syndrome? Yes, it's awful. I know, right? How do you get it? Typing. <laughs> there you go. So when you type your keyboard, when you type your keyboard is face palm down. So when you type, you have to bring your hands, your, not, not, your arms are naturally like that. But you can't type like that. That's weird. So you have to bring them palm down. So that prolator teres always works. It's always activated. And the median nerve, which is a nerve that supplies your nerve feelings for, the, for down in here, especially through here, that nerve gets irritated. And that's one of the main causations for carpal tunnel syndrome is a problem up in here. So one of the things you can do is try to massage. If massaging here feels better, see how the pain pattern is down here? Massaging here feels better, you know, you might have a, a, period, a pronator teres problem and we might have to see how the typing goes and maybe a keyboard change or, you know, sometimes you have to just lay it off, right? If it's really bad, it's really bad. Um, did they resolve yours? Whoever was that? What was that? Did they resolve? Did it resolve? Yeah, just a lot of stretching, and uh, I had to wear like a wrist brace for a little bit. Yeah, but no surgery, right? No, no, no surgery. Good. Yeah, because traditionally the surgery, what they do is down in here at the wrist, the median nerve goes through a tunnel called the carpal tunnel. That's why it's carpal tunnel syndrome. And what the tunnel really is, if you look at the wrist bones, it's a strong ligament that goes across, and that makes a little rounding of the carpals and there's space that the nerves can go through and the tendons can go through uh, for the forearm muscles that go into the hand. But the problem is when you type a lot, it gets really crowded and a lot of motion and that expands. When you do something, you heat it up, heat expands the tissues. And when there is only a finite amount of space, not that much space, it's going to inflame everything. And what is most vulnerable is the nerve. And so it hurts a lot. So yeah, stretching, splinting, not moving, mm -hmm. and then and then uh, massaging, very helpful. I know the splint help because when you're asleep, these muscles in the front are more strong than the muscles in the back, so they creep up like that, and so that's part of that. All right, let's see. I know I'm probably getting a little over my head here. I gotta keep you up <laughs> from getting too bored. So that was the pronator teres. Let's see. Now look at the names of the other muscles in the front of the wrist. They are quite descriptive and exquisite, especially the two that sound similar. The word flexor describes the motion. Carpi is the insertion side in the carpal bones. And the third word makes up those muscles indicate to travel if they travel along the ulna on the radius. Is that true or false? True. 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 Good. So that some people get frustrated or flustered because of all these names. Flexor carpal Flexor carpi radialis. So flexor is that motion. Carp is where it goes. So the carpal are here. The wrist. The wrist. 
So if you see a very called flex carpal nares, you know it's a flex, so it's a fo in the forearm. It goes to the carpals, that's the wrist bones, and it is on the ulnar side, and the ulnar goes to the pinky. If it's on the radial side, the radialis, the flexor carpi radialis, that's on the radial side, which goes to the thumb. So if you don't remember radius ulna, make sure you have radius goes to the thumb and ulna goes to the pinky. Because there is some questions about these muscles. So what I, well, we don't have to model, but what I do on myself, since I, if I'm not going to be bored, I take my hand, I bring the arm up, and I take my hand, and where the thumb meets the index finger, I put that right into my medial epicondyle, which is this bone pit. If you ever hit it, you know, you know, I had a funny bone, you know how it hurts. It's right here. So you put it down here, and then your four fingers go right over the forearm, and essentially it's the four muscles that we care about. The first one goes right across. We talked about that. That's the pronated teres. That just brings the palm down. The second one goes towards the thumb side, the third one goes to the palm of the hand, and the fourth one goes to the pinky. And, you know, you have an open book test, so it's not going to be as crucial, but things might change at some point. And you see here, when I lay the fingers on, the first one is the pronator test. That goes right across. The second one goes towards the Radial, that's the thumb side, and that's going to be the flexor corpus radialis. And the third one goes toward the middle of the hand. That's the palm maris long, which goes through the palm. And then the last one is on the in pinky side, so that will be the flexor corpus ulnaris. And then underneath those muscles, you're going to have deeper muscles, and those are mostly going to move the fingers. So the upper superficial muscles move the wrist flex the high flex the wrist the deeper muscles underneath that will work on the finger joints and flex the fingers and then we got some muscles deep inside the hand and they do a few things like that too but we're not going to worry about those and we're not going to learn about the flex the, the finger flexors all right but uh, some of their names are Flexor digitorum superficialis or profundus. Those are, you know, descriptive names that you will learn when you have to learn them and you can figure out where they might be with, with what we're so far talking about. Does that make some sense or is that too much? Makes sense. Okay. Um, you know, in the last part, in the booklet parts, let me see, where's my booklet? I'm so worried I'm going to forget all, like, because there's so many small ones that I, when it comes to the tests, there's just going to be so many little ones that I'm not going to remember. You mean from the list we have? No, like these right here, like the from the fingers and and all that. But the only right, right? No, I know it's very overwhelming. So, but from our learning at this point. In, we have the brachioradialis, which is the one on the, in the, sort of the middle between the flexors and the extensors. And then we got the forearm muscles, and they're, for our perspective, we have four of them, not more, okay? That just, that's why we don't go to more levels, because it, then you can build next time on that. Um, and we can okay. take it to the next level if you want. We just do that offline. Um, 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 but from those four, you... You want to group them where they go. So they all start in the medial epicondyle, all in the middle of the elbow. And then you want to see where they go. The one that goes right across diagonally is the pronator. And then you see, do they go to the thumb or to the pinky? That's how you differentiate ulnaris and radialis. Okay. And then there's one, you know, messer in the middle that goes all the way down to the palm. But it goes really straight down to the palm. And that will be the palm or is long. Okay. And then the rest, don't worry about none of that. Okay? Okay. I, I right. have on the booklets, in the back, on both the booklet two and three, in the, wait a minute, where is my picture here? In the back pages, on the last page, I have these barcodes, and they are, oh, muscle chart. That 
groups the muscles in a chart form with the origin, insertion, and action uh, that is grouping them according to shoulder, elbow, and back. Maybe that helps. Just see if that helps. Goes to basically a, a PDF. Um, I also have flashcards of, I mean, I have cadaver videos of different uh, muscles in here, which might be helpful, but, you know, it might be also overwhelming, depending. If you have questions about that, just reach out to me on text, and I can talk to you more about it. Okay. If you want to take it deeper in the study, Kirsty, okay? All right? Are I losing you yet? No. Ow. I know. Now it's official class. You have to be here, huh? Ha <laughs> um, But look, we're almost at the end of the questions at least. Looking at the back of the forearm, one superficial muscle reaches all the way to the fingertips. What's that muscle called? It's extensor digitorum. The there first one. Yes. Who that? The extensor digitorum. Extensor digitorum. So, yeah. Ah, uh, that Adolfo? Yes. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, you got lateral epiconda. So everything on the top of the arm, the extensors, they're all based from our perspective. They don't all, but from our perspective, they all start in the lateral epiconda and reach down towards the wrist or to the fingers. We don't have a, you know, palmar as long as there, but what we do have is we have muscles on the outside that go towards the wrist on the pinky, more muscles on the medial side, the inside, that go more towards the uh, 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 thumb. And those are extensor carpi ulnaris or extensor carpi radialis, respectively. And then you have one long muscle that you can see, you can trace it. You can trace it from here, the middle, all the way down. You trace these tendons, go to the tips of the fingers. And that's the extensor digitorum. Digits means finger. And extensors means bringing it up. You know those motions by now, right? Like flexor, extension, right? That difference? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. makes sure of that. Good. So with that, um, any questions at this point? Not so much. I feel like I'm good.